I'm going to ask if you bow your heads with me as we go to the Lord one more time before we get into his word. Father God, as we come before you, we recognize the exchange that has taken place, how you have taken our sin, our brokenness, upon yourself, and you have given us your righteousness. Father, you alone are worthy of praising and acknowledging as our King because of what you have done. And I pray that as we come to your word this morning, as our sovereign, that you would speak to us. Not so that we could retain knowledge and facts, but so that we can be changed. So that we can be agents of justice in this community. Throughout the communities we live in, in the workplaces, in our families. So Father, we give this time to you and ask that you speak to us clearly through your holy word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we work through the book of Micah over the first few months of this year, we touched on several themes and topics and important characteristics that should define us as individuals, as people of God. Characteristics that were not evident in the lives of the Israelites back in Micah's day. Well, over the next few months, we are going to continue to flesh out some of those themes, those characteristics that we looked at in Micah, beginning with justice. We are to be a just people, a people committed to doing justice. When going through the book of Micah, we define justice as this. Loving so deeply, so stubbornly, that we refuse to give up until everyone including the most vulnerable of society, can flourish and thrive. It's standing up for victims, for the poor, the powerless, the weak. And in light of that definition, let me ask you this today. Would the people of Ann Arbor, would the people of our communities associate Crossroads Community Baptist Church as a place that cares about justice. Is justice a key component of who we are as believers? It may not seem to be that big of a defining characteristic, but when we look at Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, God repeatedly calls his people out for their lack of doing justice, for their lack of exercising it, advocating for it. In fact, God makes an explicit connection between the lack of justice on one hand and false religiosity or empty worship on the other hand. We saw that firsthand back in Micah 6, and we see it again in our passage for today out of Amos chapter 5. So let's look at these verses this morning. Amos chapter 5, 21 through 24, beginning in verse 21. I... Hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. This morning, I want to work through this passage and then talk about the value of justice. Why is justice supposed to characterize our lives as individuals and as a community of believers? Let me give you a little background on Amos first and foremost, though. Amos' ministry was much shorter than that of Micah's. Micah's lasted roughly 40 years. Amos is on the job just for a few years. Amos was a prophet of God from the southern kingdom of Judah who was called to preach, to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel. 
So whereas Micah's message was for both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Amos is just talking to the northern kingdom. But they address some of the same issues. Some of the issues that Micah would speak to later on, well, Amos did so as well. This tells us that the issues that Micah brought up that we looked at over the first few months, they weren't new issues to the Israelites. They had been plaguing them for some time. And so what Amos says here in chapter 5 is echoed later on in the book of Micah, particularly chapter 6. The problem was this. The Israelites, they were complacent in their relationship with God. They felt confident that they were where they were supposed to be in relation to God. They thought because we are the people of God, we can do whatever we want as long as we worship Him. We can do whatever we want when we come and offer our sacrifices and sing our songs, and then we can go on with our lives the rest of the time taking advantage of others, oppressing them in order to get more for ourselves. Amos' words in today's verses undermine the people's false hopes, their sense of security. As a reminder for ourselves, Amos is a prophet of God, so he is speaking to the people on behalf of God. So these are God's words to the people, not Amos's. And God's words here are stinging. God makes it clear in these verses that he is opposed to what is happening in Israel's temples. Look at some of these words in these verses. I hate. I despise. I take no delight. I will not accept. I will not look upon. I will not listen. These are pointed words from God that leave no doubt how he felt about Israel's worship. Can you imagine if God came here today and said something like that to us? I hate. I despise your fellowships. I take no delight in your Sunday morning worship services. I will not accept your offerings. I will have no regard for them. Crossroads Community Baptist Church, I will not listen to your songs of praise. To me, they are just noisy babble. God's language here isn't the language of someone being guarded, politically correct or tolerant. No, God's words here are fierce. He is rebuking the behavior of the people. He is rejecting their worship. And this is the opposite of what we would expect from God and how he would speak to or treat those who have come to worship him. Although God had previously asked the people to offer burnt offerings, grain offerings, and peace offerings back in Leviticus chapters 1 through 4, and though he exhorted his people to sing his praises throughout the Psalms, God does not accept offerings and songs that do not come from hearts of love. From people who are committed to act righteously and justly. God wanted to teach his people that in order to truly worship him, they needed to walk in his ways. At that time, when worshipers offered sacrifices to God, they were supposed to confess their sins as they laid their hand upon the animals. They would commit to turning away from that sin and remain committed to God's will from that day forward. That they would live in accordance with what God commanded in his law. But since the Israelites in Amos' day, and Micah's day for that fact too, well, since they weren't living according to God's commands, their sacrifices... Their worship had no value to God. That which should have been a fragrant aroma from these sacrifices lifting up to God had become a vile stench to him. Your lifestyle, your worship, it stinks, God says here. Your songs, your wonderful instruments are nothing more than loud. Obnoxious noises. God didn't care about the worship of his people if their behavior was devoid of justice and righteousness. And this is why he says what he says 
in verse 24 in response to their empty worship, their fakeness, if you will. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You see, justice among individuals should have been the distinguishing hallmark for Israel in relation to its neighbors. But in Amos' day, God didn't see justice in the lives of the Israelites. And so through Amos, God exhorts the people here to let justice and righteousness characterize all of their activities. To allow just and right behavior to be at the heart of all that they were as individuals, as a community. And to also characterize all that they did as they lived out their lives as followers of God. And in stressing the importance of justice to them, well, we can also see the value of justice for the lives that we now live in Christ Jesus. Both on an individual level and as a collective body of believers. So what value does justice have for us? Why is it so critical for us to do justice in our world today? Well, the value of justice lies in the comparison that is made in verse 24 between justice and water. This comparison tells us several things about justice and why it should be important to us. The first thing that we see is that justice is central to our vitality. Water is so important to our lives. It's important for our physical well-being. It's important for tourism and industry, particularly in the places where I have lived in my last three homes, including Michigan. We now live in a state who pretty much is known for its shape because of the waters that surround it. And with all the fresh water that exists in Michigan, or at least that we're connected to, this is a state that also has trouble at times getting fresh water people. <coughs> we lived in the state of Florida before moving here. Another state defined by the water that surrounds it. And while I know there are beaches here in Michigan, the beaches in Florida are much nicer. <laughs> you see more people at the beaches there. It's part of the economy. It's what people do for fun. Water is also important because so many people's livelihoods depend upon it. This was particularly true in Israel at the time of Amos and Micah. They lived in a drier, more arid climate. Water was not as bountiful for them, but they also lived in an agrarian society. That means they were people tied to the land. Their livelihoods depended upon the farming of that land. And so water was vital to the people of that day. And so when Amos compares justice to water... Well, people's ears would have perked up. They would have heard the significance of what he was getting at. And what Amos was conveying to the people, and what he conveys to us as we read his words today, is this notion that water is so vital for life that we cannot exist without it. And here Amos says that godly justice is just as equally important for people as water is. Just as we won't make it long without water, we won't make it long without justice in our lives. We cannot be a spiritually healthy, vibrant, life-giving agent within our communities if justice isn't central to who we are as individuals and as a church. We could be the most generous people in this community. We could have the most entertaining worship services with the most talented musicians, the best lighting, dynamic, powerful messages from a charismatic leader. But if we aren't doing justice, if we aren't seeking to do what is right, to right the wrongs in our communities, if we aren't advocating on behalf of the broken in our midst, then God tells us he will have no regard for what we have to offer. We must advocate and fight for a world where we can administer justice according to God's holy standards. We must live lives characterized by justice and righteousness ourselves so that we are better equipped to help face the many issues that others have to deal with. 
If we are more concerned with getting what we want rather than helping others to flourish and thrive, then we will gradually die a slow death over time. If we are more concerned with getting ahead at the expense of others rather than making sure that others are treated with dignity and are able to get the things that they need, then over time what will happen is we will reveal the true nature of our hearts. We will reveal our true nature as a people who are far from the heart of God. If we want to have life, if we want to experience excitement in these dry bones of ours, if we want to experience excitement inside of our church, then we need to make sure that our worship is pleasing and glorifying to God. And God tells us here in Amos that in order for that to happen, justice and righteousness need to characterize our lives now in Christ, both individually and collectively. The second value of justice is that justice is attractive. Water is refreshing, and it attracts people who are thirsty. Perhaps you've seen an inviting body of water on a hot summer day, and you just couldn't wait to dive into that water. Perhaps you've been so parched and thirsty that you just grabbed a bottle of water and downed a hole, and you may not even like water. Water is attractive to people who don't have it. Water is attractive to people who are hot, who are thirsty. And in the same way, godly justice is attractive to those who suffer at the hands of injustice. Doing right by others, helping those in need is attractive, particularly to those who have been abused, abandoned, and rejected. In a world where not much seems right or fair, we have something to offer the world. Godly justice. Not a justice that shifts and changes according to our whims or according to what benefits us, but a justice that is driven by the righteousness of God himself. When a community of believers seeks to meet real needs, and not just because it's in vogue, not just to pat ourselves on the back, not just to make ourselves busy or to brand ourselves. No, when we seek to meet real needs in the lives of people, because it's simply who we are in Jesus Christ, it invites people in to experience the love and mercy of our God. Church communities that don't seek to meet the needs of the suffering, the wounded, of the orphan, the widowed, or the abandoned, the needs of the immigrant or the refugee, those are communities that repel others. They drive others away instead of inviting them in. In a world where justice is often administered differently based upon someone's status or attractiveness or because of the color of their skin, we have a justice to fight for that attracts people to the beauty of our Lord. Godly justice refreshes the soul. Not only is water vital to our health, not only is it refreshing and attractive, it also cleans things. Justice is restorative. Water helps to get rid of dirt and stains, restoring things to how they are intended to be. At our church in Hawaii, we had several opportunities to take mission teams to the Philippines. And I had never been to the Philippines before going to Hawaii. And on our numerous trips there, our teams would stay at this compound that a local rural church had constructed. And they had constructed this bunkhouse for mission teams that come over from the West to make things more uh, convenient for the Westerners that are visiting. And so they had bunk beds, we had a living room, we had bathrooms. But one thing we did not have was hot water, not even warm water, not even lukewarm water. <laughs> it was ice cold water given to you in a bucket. At first, I wasn't excited about that. I like my modern conveniences. I like to be pampered a little bit. But then I realized, and if you've ever been to the Philippines, Bob George knows this. The Philippines is not a place that you would characterize as a cold weather place. 
In fact, it gets quite hot and steamy there. And coming in after a long day of work where you're hot and sweaty, dirty, suddenly a bucket of cold ice water doesn't seem that bad. In fact, it's pretty enticing. And not only did that water clean you up, it, it woke you up. When you dump a bucket of ice cold water on you, you snap alert. Water, hot or cold, helps to clean all of our dirt and filth that we gather on our bodies and on our clothes. It makes us clean and it refreshes our spirits. And similarly, godly justice restores people and societies to what God intended for them to be. When we do justice, when we stubbornly love others, seeking to do right by them, we will see lives restored in Jesus Christ. And as long as we don't give up and don't lose heart, we will see change. We will see people change. We will see lives restored one life at a time. If we sit back and do nothing, either thinking that we in and of ourselves can't affect much change in our culture, our society, or thinking that, well, some other church or body of believers, they'll take care of those needs then what will happen is we won't see God's restorative power at work in our midst. But when we pursue justice, when we seek to do what is right, we will see and be encouraged by God's restorative work. Even in the midst of all the chaos that is around us, even in the midst of all the sorrow and the evil that exists in our world. We will see lives being restored and it will push us forward to continue to live just and righteous lives, as God has called us to do. The final value of justice to us that I want to touch on today, and it may not seem to be that important or that valuable, is that justice is an option. The final thing that God conveys to the Israelites is that doing justice isn't an option for them. It isn't an option that the people of God should consider. Justice isn't something that we choose to practice. No, God is getting across to the people and to us that doing justice is a natural part of who we are in relation to him. Here in verse 24, justice and righteousness are compared to rolling, ever-flowing streams. And just as water in these sources constantly flows, God's justice is supposed to be constantly flowing through us as well. God himself is always just and right. God doesn't set aside his righteousness and justice at various times. He doesn't take days off from being who he is. And in the same way as his people, we should constantly be reflecting his justice and his righteousness to the world. Justice is to characterize the behavior of all those who claim to love God. It's supposed to characterize the lives who, who claim to follow God. But justice is also as much about who we are in Christ as it, as it is about what we do. This is whom we are to be. A people seeking to make things right in our society. A people who are dedicated to helping others flourish and thrive. And ultimately, the greatest thing that we have to offer to help people thrive is to offer them Jesus Christ. It's to point them to our Savior, for Christ is the one that has dealt with us in mercy and loving kindness. He is the one who makes us just and right before our holy God. Social ministry, social justice, devoid of Jesus Christ, will help others. But it will only help them for a time. It will only help them to a certain extent. Jesus offers something more holistic. When we engage in social ministry, social justice efforts, and use them as opportunities to point people to life in Jesus Christ, then not only will we continue to grow spiritual healthy, we will also see people respond to and be changed by the attractive refreshing, restorative power of the Lord our God. If the Israelites in Amos' day had allowed justice to flow from within, if they would have allowed justice to characterize who they were, 
to govern their actions, well, God would have then looked upon their worship in a different light. He would have looked at their lives differently. But the reality for them is that they weren't deceiving God. And the truth of the matter is that we can't deceive God either. If we aren't living just and righteous lives and seeking to minister to others out of that same justice and righteousness, then our worship, our lives, won't deceive God either. We can't fool God. No matter what we may think, we think we can come and give our time on a Sunday morning, make the sacrifice of getting up and being here and then going on with the rest of our lives, not having to think much about God or doing anything that he requires or commands us to do, we think we're okay. But God says no. We can't fool God. And when we try to fool God, well, the one we end up making a fool of ourselves is ourselves. We are to pursue justice. We are to pursue godly justice and allow it to be a defining hallmark of our lives and of our church. We are to pursue and fight for justice that may not be the same thing as our world calls justice, but it's justice according to God's holy standard. And when we set the pace, when we seek to minister to others in their time of need, then not only will we be doing what God has called us to do, people will see the attractiveness of our Lord and God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. So my encouragement to you this day is simple, church family. Make justice a priority of your life. Make doing justice what you are about. Don't just give God your empty rhetoric. Don't just give God your songs of praise. Don't just give God your wonderful offerings. Live lives that are characterized by his justice and his righteousness. And that will be honoring and pleasing to our God. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for the reminder from your word that you have set the standard for what is just and what is right. And Father, as we live and operate in this world, we admit that as this world doesn't understand your justice and your righteousness, you have left it to your church. You have left it to us, your people, to teach this world about what is just and what is right, to show that and extend that. Not in hatred, not in fear, but in love. In the same grace and mercy that you have extended to us. Father, there are needs all around us. There are needs even within our own body of believers. Father, help us to take the focus off of ourselves. So that our spiritual hearts, our spiritual eyes and ears are open to the needs of those sitting next to us this morning. <clears throat> to the needs of the, the broken in our communities, to those who are hurting in our workplaces. Father, may we be able to be who you have called us to be in those moments, representing you, doing what is right in your eyes. Father, help us to be that kind of church. Help us to be that kind of people. Help us to take a stand for what is right and true in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen.